Good morning. Um, I actually finished residency in 2010, so it wasn't that long ago, but um, I know. But I was like, oh, wow, I have been a little bit longer than that. So um, for those of you that weren't here last month, I gave a talk more on um, clinical documentation and how to um, be more happy in what you do. And so we're going to do just a little bit of that today, but um, most of today is going to focus on the quality requirements with ACGME. And um, I, it, this could actually cover about three or four lectures, and so I'm trying to condense it down into two. So that's how I'm relating it into the happiness advantages that instead of a health stream activity for the residents, this is a lecture instead. So um, learning objectives today, we're going to go over what healthcare quality and utilization management are. Um, identifying what the clear um, healthcare quality pathways are. So clear is the clinical learning environment review, which is one of our new requirements with ACGME. Describing the steps um, that we've implemented for here um, regarding the um, resident quality projects. And I think from what I can see, most of the residents um, are already involved. So that is not going to be a big thing, but I feel like I keep getting questions about how it's going. And so I want to lay it out um, a little bit more formally and then talk a little bit about um, where my passion is, and that's utilization management, and then how it relates back to quality of care. So healthcare quality was defined by the Institute of um, Medicine in the 1990s, and um, they defined it as the degree to which healthcare services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. And so the initial goal of quality measures is really to improve patient care. Um, I note that in today's um, healthcare world, it, uh, quality measures and things become pretty frustrating, but at the end of the day, um, what I try to remind myself of is the reason that they came about was both due to improvements in technology, but also because there were bad doctors out there that weren't following standards of care, and so this holds us all to a higher level of accountability. So the Institute of Medicine uh, defines the six different quality domains, so effectiveness, which is providing care um, that's based on scientific uh, evidence and you, do, you don't overutilize or underutilize. And so they've done a lot of studies of Medicare, um, patients with Medicare, and the spending is in the billions of um, overutilization, not following um, standard of care. And that's where this a big push for quality of care has come from. Efficiency, and so you will hear me talk a lot about do they need to be here? Is it, um, you know, they've been here for two midnights and they're in observation and things like that. So it's maximizing um, efficiency of care, not waiting for, um, I see cardiologists, so I'll say not waiting for a heart cath for three days, things like that. Um, equity, so making sure that um, we're closing the healthcare disparities, which that's one part of um, quality of care that I did not realize was a uh, major part. So I kept saying that the healthcare disparities was not part of my role, but um, that is involved with the, um, the quality domains. Patient-centeredness, so we all know about patient-centered care. Um, safety, so just protecting our patients from harm. And then timeliness, so obtaining the needed care without, with, while minimizing delay. So that goes back to your efficiency as well. So this is what we kind of feel like patient-centered care is. We're on the computer and the patient's in the bed. That's a nice, smiling, happy kid in the bed, apparently. but. Um, that's not really supposed to be the goal. The goal is supposed to be that you're more involved with your patient. So the CLARE pathway, there's six different things that we're supposed to um, make sure that we have checked off on our box to make sure that we're providing good education. And so um, when I opened the observation unit, they did this thing where like anything that you're good on, you put in green. If you're uh, somewhat okay, you put it in yellow. And if you're totally not there, then you put it in red. So I've continued that in a lot of the things that I do. So um, pretty okay on education. I could justify it, but I don't think it's where it needs to be. So that's what we'll have lecture series throughout um, the year, probably quarterly, just kind of going over a little bit more in detail about what quality is. I think that some of the programs also provide that within their specific program. So education on quality improvement, resident and fellow engagement and quality improvement activities. That varies from residency to residency on what the actual requirement is. I think ER, you only have to complete one project during your entire time here. Um, for internal medicine, I think you only have to complete one project, but um, it's expected that you're um, continuously involved in the quality improvement activity. 
all of the yellow doesn't really show up, but residents or fellows receive data on quality metrics. So we aren't really doing that. And I'm trying to figure out what the best uh, mode to be able to get that information. It is on ozone, um, but we have to be able to prove that you know what the quality metrics are and how um, things are improving. And, and so um, that we're working on how we're going to carry that out. Resident and fellow engagement and planning for quality improvement. That's somewhat in progress because um, the with through the resident committees, we are doing different projects, but um, that can still be improved. And in red is really the healthcare disparities. So uh, resident, fellow, and faculty member education on reducing healthcare disparities and engagement in the clinical site initiatives to address healthcare disparities. So we'll talk about a little bit more about that, but essentially um, our um, hospital, like a lot of hospitals, um, do not know what our healthcare disparities are and specifically to our region. So we know we have a large proportion of uh, patients that don't have insurance and uh, Native American and African American population. And um, we know that in Tulsa, there's been a big push because we actually, between North Tulsa and South Tulsa, about 10 to 15 years ago, they did a study and there's actually a 10-year, um, North Tulsans have a 10-year lower expected um, life expectancy than South Tulsans. And so, they're um, working through a lot of different grant work to uh, reduce that healthcare disparity and already making uh, big leaps um, in reducing that healthcare disparity. Um, another stat that I found was that 40% um, of Tulsa's population is in North Tulsa, but only 4% of the doctors were there. And so there's been a big push to move a lot more physician offices um, into that area to provide the care. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, Claire will do um, site visits, and uh, I think our first site visit won't be for another year, but um, when they come, they give us 10 days notice that they're coming, and this is through ACGME. And so um, we'll be doing mock site inspections and things like that, and um, Dr. Alexopoulos is actually the clear um, person that's in charge of all of it, and then I'm in charge of the quality component. So the things that they'll ask regarding quality from what I've read from other institutions is, um, are residents, fellows, and faculty uh, familiar with the clinical site's priorities for quality improvement? And so the quality department is, is developing a priority project list, which will be sent out so that you guys will have that information. And the rest of it is all in the planning stages because they really didn't have those requirements with the AOA previously. Okay, so just very briefly, can I see by a show of hands who all is involved I'm going to do two different questions. In the hospital committee uh, quality projects? Okay. And the, yeah, you are. <laughs> so even my committee is still getting underway on ours. Um, and then who's involved in projects through their residency? Okay. I knew ER, cardiology. Okay. Um, so forming the team, what we set up for here was just that each committee, hospital committee, the faculty um, that or the committee chair would be the lead of that team. And there, we're seeing a lot of uh, um, problems with that, and so we'll be continuing to try and improve how we do that going forward. You set your aim statement, which needs to be specific and measurable, um, realistic and time-oriented. You figure out what you want to measure, select and test and implement your change, and then you spread it. So basically, um, I wanted to give an example of uh, the Infection Control Committee. Um, they wanted to um, evaluate hand washing and compliance because the quality data that's been reported has been showing that, uh, well, first they group residents and students together, and then the quality data that they're reporting is showing that that, that group it has the highest rate of non-compliance with appropriate hand washing. And so it was to really, there's, a, there's two goals. It's to prove that that data is wrong, but more it's to improve the compliance with hand washing should be the true goal. So they decided to start small and start with just one floor, um, so 7 East, and improve hand washing compliance by blank percent. I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head. But that's how you make it a very small, achievable, attainable goal. What we do is we start to say, oh, um, let's improve, I'm going to give my committees, uh, the tele let's improve utilization of telemetry. Well, that's a huge project. And so rather than trying to start there, you start with, okay, let's 
evaluate our current resident and, and maybe medical student knowledge on telemetry utilization in the hospital because there's actually protocols and guidelines for ordering telemetry. And so that's how you start to narrow it down to where it's achievable outcomes. And then you start to uh, get engaged in what you're doing because you can see the outcomes of what you're doing. So this is a little bit fuzzy, but I think it takes you through the, the process a little bit better. So at the top, what are we trying to accomplish? So you set your aim statement and your improvement requires setting your aims. It should be time specific and measurable, like I said, and then define your specific population of patients. So whether or not you're, if you're doing something with um, congestive heart failure readmission rates and, and you're defining it down to there, you don't start with all patients that came back within 30 days or readmission, but you narrow it down to just one diagnosis. And then establishing your measure, so that's where the quality department comes into play because they can do a lot more graphs and analyzing of data than what I can. Um, selecting your change, so um, you figure out what you want to change and then you follow this plan, do, study, act model. So you plan it out, you do it, then you see what your results were and then you, you revise it and you keep going through this cycle. And that's really the model for improvement that we uh, use at this facility. So for the OSU uh, resident quality projects, and I should add that if students are ever interested, this is something that eventually we want to have as a rotation. But if you're interested in doing a quality project or getting scholarly activity, um, this is a great way to kind of help and also to help your residents. So um, residents are assigned to the committees. They work with the committee chair, ideally, who's in, who then serves as the faculty advisor. So right now, uh, ER, family medicine, internal medicine, ob gyn and surgery are all involved. And with this next cycle, all residents will be assigned to hospital committees. That doesn't mean that all residents will be participating in those hospital committee projects, but they'll at least be aware of what's going on. Some programs have decided to do more outpatient focus. And so right now, um, that's what leadership is um, directing. So outpatient is pediatrics and psych. I believe psychiatry is going to do both inpatient and outpatient. So. Um, and then I'm the designated quality representative, and then Jamie Flower also helps to implement the procedures and education moving forward. So just for people that may look at this later, I put what our roles are, but really it's just oversight. And then the quality department helps with data support. So in June, we're gonna do a resident quality project symposium, June 13th at 7 a.m. So the goal is really to have your projects done by like June 2nd or 3rd, or at least um, part of the project done that you could then present. Um, we wanted to have something rolling um, in the 2016-17 academic year since quite a few of the programs have initial accreditation or are in pre-accreditation. So as we move into more formal accreditation, that's whenever um, we'll have a lot more of a curriculum, formal curriculum. So each group will give about five minute presentation and then um, we're trying to look at if we could also do it as a poster session to where it could count as scholarly activity as well. So more details will be coming out on that on email. Okay, so before I move in um, to uh, very much of the utilization management, which is the fun part, so I'm gonna turn the lights up and do another little activity, which I know you guys are so excited about. So let me turn the lights up. Heather Jones is still awake. I think they're back here somewhere, aren't they? There. Okay. So part of what I talked about last time was the happiness advantage, and there's this guy, Sean Apor, who um, does positive psychology, and he did a lot of research at Harvard. And I'll say I'm probably his, like, biggest fan now because I've read both his books, and I think it's really fascinating. So last time we did a little experiment where you smiled at each other and then everyone was laughing and, and um, it's fun for me to watch that. We're not going to do that again because I don't think it works twice. But what we will do is another activity that um, I went to a communications and healthcare um, training course and um, a lot of the residents will end up getting crucial conversations which is a separate, totally separate um, um, goals and different things so I'm not overlapping with that. Um, but I found it really interesting, and so what I'm going to do is have you guys do it and then kind of see at the end what, what you guys think. So um, the first thing is going to be to find a partner. The ER residents look so excited. <laughs> um, 
find a partner, and the only rules that I have are a couple because I always have to have rules. Um, it can't be someone that's at your same level. So if you're a student, it can't be another student. If you're a PGY1, it can't be another PGY1. If you're a cardiology fellow, it can't be another cardiology fellow. I got these rules from you, Tucker, because whenever you did the whole, uh, you can't say I'm, what was it, on the people's strengths. I'm too detail-oriented. We couldn't say that in your interview for internal medicine. So, and it can't be in your program. So if you're internal medicine, you can't pick an internal medicine person. So partner up, and then I'll give you rules. And it doesn't matter to me if you're standing. You're only going to have to talk to this person for a total of like three or four minutes. But once you find your partner, then I'll have more instructions. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I got to listen to him for an hour. It was so cool. Okay, about 15 more seconds, so find a partner, find a partner. Does anyone not have a partner? Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So give me your ears for just a second, and I'll tell you the rules. So what you're going to do is um, to your partner... Who else needs a partner? There are two people right there. Right? Okay. Yep, there's one. <laughs> if you see a resident that doesn't have a partner, call them out. Thank you, Cook. Okay. I'm sorry, I know it's embarrassing to call you out, but does everyone have a partner? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Okay. What you'll do, so pit, the younger person, the lower man on the totem pole, not the younger person, the, the younger on the totem pole gets to go first. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're a student, you're going first. If you're a PGY1, you're probably going first. Um, so think of a story of something that has happened in your life. It doesn't have to be related to medicine, but um, ideally it probably could be. But um, it could have impacted you positively or negatively. It's just up to you and whatever your aura feels like today. Um, <laughs> I look at Shania because she didn't smile last time. So, um, And for two minutes, you're going to talk to the other person. The other person, person number two, your only rules are to just listen. And then you, at the end of this, then you're going to tell them their story back to them. So you can, you can listen and you cannot speak. So you can acknowledge, you can whatever you need to do, but you cannot speak during that whole time. So no asking questions or anything. So person number one is going to tell a meaningful story for two minutes about something that impacted them in their life. It can be anything. I had a really hard time, so I came up with a work-related one whenever I did this. So, um, so person number one, two-minute story. Person number two just can't interrupt and can't talk. Okay? All right, ready, go. Thirty more seconds.
Okay, go ahead and stop. And now person number two is going to tell that story that was so meaningful to them back to them, including the pertinent details. And so, ready, go. Okay, you can stop, and then everybody can go back to their spots. Well, actually, wait right there for just a second. So who thinks that they did a really good job retelling the story? Okay, and I'll ask that again in a second. Who thinks they didn't do so hot at retelling the story? Okay, everyone did amazing. No one missed any of the details of names or anything like that. Very fascinating. Okay, who thinks they did a good job? You don't? You don't think you did a good job retelling it? Okay, I was going to pick you because you took like 20 seconds to start. <laughs> so, how did, what do you think was the hardest thing about it? Uh, you're on YouTube. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, did you think he was listening to you the whole time? Yes. yes. What made you think that he was listening the whole time? Good eye contact. <laughs> okay. Was it hard not to interrupt? Yeah, that's what I found. Okay, we can go back to our spots, and then I'll, I guess I'll just share my personal experiences. Dr. Cook, did you retell? You retell? <laughs> so while you guys are going back to your seats, just for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you, my experience was that I thought I was a really good listener, just like apparently all of you are still under the impression that you are. Um, <laughs> but I'm not. That's what I figured out, is that as I was listening to this lady tell her story about how she met her husband, I forgot her husband's name. I couldn't remember the name of the place where they were working, that they met each other. There's just a lot of little details that it made me much more aware of the fact that I think I'm listening, but I'm actually thinking about the 12 other things that I needed to get done. And so it's kind of an awareness of um, how we multitask so much, and if we're efficient, then we're multitasking all day. And so we multitask so much that we don't realize that we need to focus down. The other thing is that the average physician interrupts a patient after seven seconds. And so I wanted you guys to see what it felt like to allow someone who can actually tell an effective story um, a minute and a half to tell their story. They probably they ran out of stuff. At like 45 seconds, people were running out of things to say. Um, so yes, our patients don't typically tell a concise story just like we would like it. But they're starting to do more and more studies on if we allow patients to talk for two to three minutes, how it actually decreases your time spent with the patient because you can establish your agenda early in the visit. And so a lot of it's focusing on agenda setting. And once you've let them talk for a full minute without interrupting, then you say, okay, um, was there anything else that you wanted to address today? Anything else you wanted to address today? And with a couple of the patients, it doesn't work. Um, because they just keep on coming up with 30 other things and then you just want to stop asking them. But if you pick a couple of patients in clinic or wherever you are, then you get all those agenda items out at the very beginning, then you don't get that frustrating, oh, one more thing, as you're walking out the door. And so it's really a fascinating, there, it's the um, uh, healthcare 
uh, I'm going to blank on the name of it, but it's communication in healthcare, and it's a whole training program, and it's centered around setting your agenda early in your um, patient visits. And, and that, in the hospital, I think what we end up doing is we think we, we know why the patient's there. We know what our agenda is before we go in. But then we are asking them, you know, anything happened over, overnight? Was there anything that you wanted me to address today or anything you want me to let the doctors know if you're a medical student? So making sure that you ask those open-ended questions, not just your um, how long has it been going on? Tell me more about that. Um, but more just trying to set that agenda um, can be your goal. So um, do you guys want me to pull those shades down? It got really bright all of a sudden. And I don't you got, we can roll them down, I think, for, so that people don't have to use. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I got real bright. So um, that's my little spiel on communication. Does anybody else have something else that they wanted that they felt like they wanted to share? Probably not. Dr. Cook, what did you think was hard about it? Well, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope that you guys felt like that as I interrupt her, um, but I hope, <laughs> it really is, but I hope you guys felt like that and that you're just being shy. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's really true. So what he said was that sometimes we start to develop our differential diagnosis. And so as students, you may not be thinking that. You may just be thinking, oh, what else am I going to ask them? I can't think of anything else on my PQRC. What was Q? Um, <laughs> but for residents, that's what I teach, is that as soon as they start talking, I'm thinking of 30 things in my head that it could be. And as they keep talking, you should narrow it down. Not as you keep asking questions, you narrow it down. Um, so it, it depends on the patient. I get that completely, but it is. As you de develop your differential, it should be as you listen to them. So the focus is just to try to spend that extra 20, 30, 45 seconds of listening and just see how much the patient then is like, oh, my gosh, they're not interrupting me. So, okay, moving on very quickly. So just a little bit about utilization management. So um, I'm called the utilization director for this hospital, and it's also called physician advisor, and it's basically all about effective, efficient care. And so we evaluate cost and the quality of medical services. So I, I kind of put my own little definition of it's the behind the scenes um, business side of being a doctor. And so this turned out really fuzzy, but um, it's a good slide to kind of show you how the process is overall. So uh, I lost my. So up here it has patient in need, and at intake, then you have your service accounts manager, and uh, they they get registered. Then if they're inpatient or outpatient, um, assessment and evaluation. Then inpatient, outpatient treatment, disposition, and you discharge them, and the patient leaves. Behind the scenes, you have your business office, then you have uh, medical staff and administration overseeing all the care that's being ordered, and that includes labs, radiology, pharmacy, case management's involved, and whether or not it's observation or inpatient status. During that time, behind the scenes down here, even further, is um, we're guaranteeing their insurance information, um, we're looking at clinical documentation to make sure it's up to par so that we can justify um, whichever payer source it is. Uh, patient payment arrangements are being made. And that still is probably one of my least favorite phone calls is that if you're standing in a room and then the people call and they want to talk about the bill with the patient while you're standing there and then you're like, get off the phone. <laughs> um, but it's all part of the process of we are a business. Um, and so then you collect your data that's necessary to bill. Down here on the bottom, it's a DRG. That's just a payment model from Medicare. You're looking at physician signatures, which has become a lot easier with electronic health <coughs> records. And again, adequate documentation. And that's why you guys get pounded by these documentation specialists, is that it's all this behind the scenes that has to go on so that then whenever they are leaving the hospital, you're ready to capture your charge code, which is the billing for, for the hospital. And then it's converted into a billing claim. 
and then billed to the primary payer or their insurance company. So all this during the stay changes into charges, which then gets coded out by these by medical coders. Then it goes to the billing people for billing and accounts receivable, and then we have to deal with denials and rejected claims, um, or if they say no, uh, they've maxed out their benefits on this insurance, now you go to their secondary payer. And then it's a big process that can sometimes take um, a, a, over a year to get the final payment for your service. So that's why behind the scenes, it's a very elaborate process, and, and here we're working on all these processes to improve each step along the way. So in utilization review, um, I lead that committee, and I just wanted to put, I had a lot of problems with the formatting on this um, PowerPoint, but um, things that we look at. So we're looking at length of stay. Our overall length of stay looks good from month to month. We really don't have problems with that. Our less than two midnight inpatient stay. So if a patient is in inpatient status for the students, then they should stay two midnights or more. If it's less than two midnights, then they probably would have been appropriate for what's called observation, which is an outpatient service, but it's still in the hospital. Um, outlier reviews, so those are patients that stayed over seven days. Um, cabbages are, um, have, we have an extended length of stay so that we actually have a dashboard and a work group for that. And then readmissions is a patient that comes back within 30 days to the hospital and is in inpatient status both times. The second time they come back, if it's for the same diagnosis, then it's not being, then uh, Medicare typically doesn't pay. What we're finding is that with our end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis, they are paying. So that's good news for us for right now. Um, but overall, our readmission rate is still um, high. And the reason I put readmission length of stay is because a lot of our readmissions are staying under two midnights. And so it's something that I would encourage you guys, we're going to be doing more and more education. Can you hear me? Okay. On, okay, can you, if we can even just look back and see where they here in the last 30 days, and then even more critically analyze, do they really, are they going to be here for two midnights? And then, you know, you don't ever, like, formally uh, cheat the system by put, putting all of them in observation. You still make an accurate decision uh, based on the clinical knowledge, but I, it's just kind of a more in-depth review. So we review professional services. So the OPIB is outpatient and a bed utilization for the surgeons. Um, we can also look at CAT scan ordering. We're going to look at physical therapy um, consultations and things like that to make sure we're appropriately ordering testing and services. Um, and then we look at observation data, and then um, something called Code 44, which I'm not really going to go into for today. And then um, we're starting to do case reviews each month um, to kind of get more education out there. So very briefly, just to highlight some of the things that, um, that we see as areas for improvement at this facility. So our less than two midnight inpatient stays. So um, at the time of admission, if we, if we think that the patient is going to stay for two midnights or more, then they should be in inpatient status, which is in order. Um, our percentage of patients that stayed less than two midnights is staying consistently around 17%, which is pretty high. There isn't a dedicated goal. I just put that it's less than 8 to 10% because that's what other facilities I've talked to, their, their rates of uh, less than two midnight stays. So um, we're having about 100 a month. Um, so it's three to five per day that stay under two midnights that are inpatient. And so we're, we're wanting to shift that into observation, but it's a very slippery slope because if they were really sick when they first came in, you don't automatically switch them over for every payer. The uh, Medicaid's really, this is more for resident level, but uh, Medicaid's really the only payer that is not paying if it's less than two midnights. So all the other payers are still paying as long as you justify it with your uh, documentation. So that's a big area that we can improve on. I, wrote, I look at weekend discharges just because... Um, we don't have case management in-house during that time. So. so I wanted to kind of show you guys a sample denial letter. And um, I just think that they're so interesting because they'll send, it says, Dear Oklahoma State University Medical Center, Telegen is authorized by Oklahoma Health Care Authority to review inpatient hospital services provided to sooner care patients in Oklahoma. Blah, 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 blah. They tell me why they're doing what they're doing. And then they say... Um, a physician reviewer has completed review of the care provided to the patient identified above based on a careful review and any additional information provided by you, the physician reviewer reached the following determination regarding the admission denial. And then they give you an, a, a synopsis of the stay, which is usually pulled word for word from your discharge summary or from the H&P, and they just piece 
together word for word documentation without quotes, which always bothers me. And then they say, she was closely monitored overnight, showed improvement in her breathing, and was discharged the next day with appropriate discharge instructions, including a biopsy appointment for her lung mass. The patient could have safely been managed at the observation level of care. And then there, what I consider a threat, but it's fine because I see it as a challenge, is we will use the review results to conduct tracking and trending of review outcomes. So they're basically saying, we're identifying that you're making mistakes, and we're going to track and trend you. So then we look at it on the back end and we, we look and see, okay, does it look like from the documentation was the patient sick when she came? This one was, was not that much and so they had a good point. So we had to relinquish that money back to them. And what they can do is just go and take their money back or they just don't pay it. And so it's really a fascinating process that once you kind of get involved in it, I don't see how anyone can't be engaged in it because you basically take what that physician reviewer um, who I always dream of them as like this 75-year-old person who hasn't practiced medicine for 40 years, which will be me one day, but um, that I'm going to outsmart them. And so I'm looking through the medical record to see what documentation has been provided. And, we, and we've overturned quite a few. Um, the people that are writing our denial letters and helping me um, have overturned throughout a lot of different varieties of denials, uh, close to a million dollars in charges in this year alone. Um, so it requires diligent effort. Um, one of the quality things that they're following is the um, cabbages, and so this is just an example of the improvement that you can see over time. So I should have put up the 2016 dashboard because this was almost all red, um, but they're looking at total number of cabbages. We want to have about 15 per month. We're not there. And then they're asking for the Euro score, which is a um, risk mortality index to be here, so then that can help us to, to kind of go through these other things. Average length of stay of, of cabbage patients before surgery, our goal is less than two days. Previously, we were at five and six days, and so that's improved dramatically. Um, the standard of care is for a patient to be extubated six, within six hours of surgery. We were sitting at 20-ish hours or more just due to um, not having, we had a, protocol, but then we weren't extubating at night, um, but other facilities do that. So through this uh, work group that includes nurses and a variety of staff, um, they were able to push that down through education. And um, it was six to eight. Last month was a higher month at 13 hours. So it's really interesting once you start to get involved in improvement measures, how you can see um, what you're doing is really improving. Um, a quick word about readmissions for uh, we're pretty consistent that our readmissions, I touched on this a little while ago, so this was um, under one midnight, one midnight, two midnights, three midnights. So when they come back in, 25% of them are staying under two midnights. So that tells you that we have a big problem with our placement status from the time of admission. And so we're looking at creative ways to improve that process um, because what people, what doctors see in the ER can be markedly different than what you see whenever the patient gets to the floor because they can improve rapidly. So where that disconnect is and where we need to get case management involved um, earlier in the process in the, in the right way. Um, we did try it last year and it, it didn't work. Um, and then what I thought was fascinating is that most of our readmissions are coming back. 48% came back within zero to 10 days. And so I used to always say, well, of course, we can't treat them for 30 days after they're gone. They always come back in at 27, 28 days, but they're actually half of them are coming back within 10 days. And only about 10% of those are our dialysis patients that have to be inpatient. So really starting to, to dive into what is going on with that and uh, how can we improve the discharge process. Um, most of the research out there on zero to 10 days readmissions is that um, your discharge process is ineffective in some way, whether it's um, follow-up care or um, services at the time of discharge, which I realize that we have a unique uh, challenge in that a lot of our patients can't get the care that they actually would need. So if they get an amputation and they refuse to go to a nursing home, what can we do other than give them home health and know that they'll come back? Those are the ones that we just say, okay, that's fine, but it's the ones that we could prevent um, that have insurance of some sort um, that we're really looking into a little bit more. Outpatient bed, this is more for surgeons and I don't see any in here. And this was just where the um, CDI is clinical documentation, and they have overturned, uh, it was $1.5 million in charges, which is a, a, what you make off of your charges is about 10%. So they've still overturned a lot of denials. And so that's the big 
um, thing right now is just um, denials. And we have a lot more outpatient denials. So far this year, we have 275 denials on services and 70 on inpatient. Um, about 30 of those are um, less than two midnight stay denials. I wanted to just point out very quickly, the observation unit, there is a dashboard for that. So we track how many hours, what the total volume is. And so, and then our biggest thing is the average observation length of stay. So our goal is to really under 20 hours, more like 16, but we wanted to set an achievable goal. So we were, last year when we opened, we were 23, 23. We got down to 21 pretty consistently. And then up to 24 over, um, the holidays in January when it was a little more busy and then we're staying pretty consistently right around 22 hours. Um, a year and a ago at this time for internal medicine and family medicine, our average length of stay for observation patients was 35 hours. So by having the observation unit, even though I know sometimes the nurses are stalking you guys and asking about when are you getting them out of here, we've made huge improvements, which is a, a huge cost saving measure. And that's all I had. So uh, cure sometimes, treat often, and comfort always. Stacy Cronister had that in her lecture at the STAB Symposium, and I love that. It's a Hippocrates quote. So if you guys have any questions about your quality projects or students, if you're interested in it, then uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.